At this time, we want to also extend a welcome to all of you who are watching our service online um, on this Veterans Day. And any of you who are watching our veterans, we ex extend our gratitude to you as well. We've already recognized our veterans as part of this service, and uh, we say thank you to you, too. And uh, at this time, I believe, choir anthem, do you want to say something, or you want me to...
Yes, and as we come to um, our scripture rememberizing, we've been working on, because of the election, Second Chronicles 714, and um, you have it up there with quite a few uh, holes in it, but uh, early service did well, so we will see how you do with this. If my... So something happened in the middle there, <laughs> but the beginning and the end was good. Here's the whole thing, and let us say this one more time. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins heal their land. We'll heal their land. Um, next week we'll have a new uh, scripture memorizing or maybe it'll be a refresher. Uh, I'm not quite sure uh, at this point is as well. But um, at this time we're going to uh, turn it over for our scripture reading. And uh, Jean, you have that? Yes. Okay. Um New Testament lesson, taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 11 through 20. I'll be reading from the New American Standard version of the Bible. Um, if you would, if you like, you can follow along, Pew Bible, page 1084. And I, saw in and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. And his eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems. And he has a name written upon him, which no one knows except himself, and he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God and the, the Almighty. And, he, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, to all the birds which fly in mid heaven, come assemble for the great supper of God. In order that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of the mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit upon them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves and small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat upon the horse and against, him, and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet, and who, who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. 
So when's the New Testament lesson? Um, if, you, if you're able, can you please stand for the gospel lesson? Now the gospel lesson... It's taken from the book of Mark, chapter 13, verses 1 through 11. Again, I'll be reading from the New American Standard. And if you would like, you can um, follow along in the Pew Bibles on page 881. And as he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? And Jesus began to say to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and he will mislead many. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. These things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will arise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogue, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations, and when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not be anxious before him about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Blessed be the word of the Lord. Amen. 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 May be seated. So in this, um, in this election that was just completed, um, interesting, both, both candidates had change slogans. I thought that was interesting. The Harris campaigns was a new way forward, a new way forward. Um, Donald Trump sort of stuck with what he had for a while. Make America great again, again, make it, you know, so. So both saw a need for change, obviously in different directions, but both saw the need for change. Now, last I looked, uh, there were about 144 million votes counted. And it's, it's interesting because that means there are more than 70 million people who are really upset with the results. There are 70 million people who are happy with the results of the election. There are some people who are scared about the results of the election. And, and I wanna speak to both the winners and the losers. Now, when I say losers, don't get me wrong. You're not a loser, you're on the losing side. That's all, that's all I mean by that. By the way, when I, when I outline this message, I want to make this clear. I did not know who was going to win. 
So basically, it would have been the same message, I just flipped the names. Because it could be the same message, just flip, flip the names. Um, so here it is. To those who are on the losing side, this is what I want to say to you. Be comforted, it's not the end of the world. It is not the end of the world. God is the one who determines when it's the end of the world. No one else. It's not the end of the world. In fact, Jesus realized people would often think it's the end of the world. And that's why he said, as recorded in Mark 13, then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, <coughs> excuse me, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. In other words, we see all this stuff. We think the world's coming to an end. And Jesus says, calm down. It's not necessarily coming to an end. Okay, calm down. It won't come to an end until Jesus comes back. Right until Jesus returns. Jesus is the one who determines when it comes to an end. Now, for those who are worried uh, about the, uh, the, the new the president-elect, the new president will do, will do a lot of harm to our nation, I will say this, I will say this, um, a personal anecdote. I first started following presidential elections, Jimmy Carter versus Ronald Reagan, 1980. That was 12 presidential elections ago, right? And one thing I have learned, maybe two things I have learned. One is that um, one side, and this both sides do it, one side will always say things to get people scared about the other side political rhetoric. They will always say this. And the other thing I've learned is a lot about one side of what one side says about the other side, a lot of it does not happen. It doesn't happen. Now, it doesn't happen, I think, for several reasons. One reason is it's political rhetoric to begin with. That's the whole point, right? Like I say, both sides do it, and the whole point is to get you afraid about what will happen if the other person is elected. But there's also a house, there's a senate, there's court systems, there's other factors that prevent whatever from taking place. Again, I mean, I'm just trying to lower, hopefully, the anxiety a little bit. Because don't forget, God is still in control. God is still in control. The prophet Jeremiah, prophet of Israel, and um, you know, we think, you, you think we got it bad? What was Jeremiah facing? What was the nation of Israel facing? They were actually being conquered by the Babylonians. Thousands were being killed, thousands upon thousands. If you weren't killed, a lot were rounded up and taken, exiled to other places. Right? That's what was going on. And Jeremiah wrote this little book called Lamentations in which he talks about all the terrible and horrible things. How the horrible ways people were dying and, and all that are in this book. And in the middle of it, though, he writes this. The thought of my affliction and my homelessness is wormwood and gall. My soul continually thinks of it and is bowed down within me. He is, he's, his heart is broken. He says, but this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So he's going to have hope in the Lord in spite of his country crumbling around him because what does he say his mercies never come to an end they're new every morning 
Great is your faithfulness, Lord. Be comforted, it's not the end of the world. Now, I do want to speak to those on the winning side. And the message I would have for you is simply this. Donald Trump is not your savior. He is not your savior. There is only one savior. There is only one who willingly died for you in a weird sort of election craziness. He actually got grazed by a bullet, but he wasn't willingly going to die for us, for you. But Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead for you. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. Our ultimate hope is not in a president. Never our ultimate hope. I mean, the psalmist realized this, Psalm 20. Some take pride in chariots and some in horses. What's he talking about, chariots and horses? That's the military power. Some say, we got all this power. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Some take pride in chariots, some in horses. And the psalmist says, but our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. Our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. Trump will not defeat evil. He will not defeat evil. Only Jesus will do that. That's why we read Revelation. I know, it's weird, it's odd, it's all that. But when he says, then I saw heaven open and there was a white horse, its rider was faithful and true. No, its rider is Jesus. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns, and he has a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, and the armies of heaven wearing fine linen and white, white and pure were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And what's going to happen? This is talking about the end of the time when evil will be defeated And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed in its presence the sign by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were killed by the sword of the rider on the horse. You know, that's how things are going to end. It's going to be Jesus on that horse. He is the one we trust. So that brings me to the last thing that I wanted to say. You know, the title, Now Things Can Change, uh, Jeanette, Jeanette Weaver called me up and she said, she said, are you sure that title's not too like, you know, people are going to think you're partisan or something. And I told her, I actually sort of like provocative titles if it gets people to think, I wonder what that's about. What's he going to say? Blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I sort of, but it's probably not what you're thinking about. I will say yes, one thing is true. Now things can change. But things could have changed before under the last president. Things can change under the next president. Why? Because it's not as much about the president, it's about you and me. It's you and me. You're the one. We're the ones who create the change. Now, don't get me wrong. Politics has a place. Policies do affect people's lives for good or for bad. 
And that's why as Christians, I think we're called to vote. But you remember when Jesus was talking to Pilate and Pilate was like saying, you know, right before Jesus' death, Pilate saying, you know, I have, the, I have all the power here. I can release you. I can have you killed. And then Pilate says something about Jesus. They say, you're a king. And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. It's a different kingdom. That's the kingdom we need to work with. That's the kingdom we really need to fight for. That kingdom that's not part of this world. Because in that kingdom, when things change in that kingdom, the change goes much deeper than anything on this earth. When somebody new comes into that kingdom, their lives, not right away, not immediately, but their lives can be totally transformed, totally changed. We've seen it time and time again. It's in Jesus' kingdom that real change takes place. It's in Jesus' kingdom that those changes and what changes takes place forever, eternal. I have news for you. As much as I love this country, United States of America, it will not last forever. There will be a day. There will be no United States of America. But there will never be a day in which the kingdom of Jesus Christ is gone. It will always, always be. So I want to close with a, with a story. Um, you know, there was a time in which people would go to arenas, large arenas, and they would watch contestants. They'd watch contestants kill one another. I'm not talking about boxing, mixed martial arts, those things. No, I'm talking about the gladiator contests of ancient Rome. And they'd kill one another. Don't do that anymore. When did it stop? Why did it stop? Well, that's interesting. You know, Constantine the Great became governor, became governor, became emperor of Rome um, early 300 ADs. He tried to stop the gladiator games, in part because now there's debate about this, whether or not he actually became a Christian himself. Probably not. But he really had a heart towards Christianity and Christians. And of course, Christians were very much against the gladiator games. And he tried to stop them unsuccessfully. Then how did they stop? Well, let me um, read to you a quote from a church historian, Theodoret, who was a bishop in Syria. He wrote a book in the fifth century, which was entitled, Ecclesiastical History, a history of the church in five books from A.D. 322 to the death of Theodore of Mopsuestia, A.D. 427. That title just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? You know, it just, my goodness. But anyways, um, he writes a story about a monk from the eastern part of the empire who went to Rome and witnessed the gladiator games. His name was Telemachus. And this is what Theodora wrote. After gazing upon the combat from the amphitheater, he descended into the arena and tried to separate the gladiators. The bloodthirsty spectators, possessed by the demon who delights in the effusion of blood, was irritated at the interruption of their cruel sports and stoned him who had occasioned the cessation. After being apprised of this circumstance, the admirable emperor numbered him with the victorious martyrs and abolished these iniquitous spectacles. That emperor was um, Honororus, Emperor Honororus. Um, so, some secular historians go on and, and you know, whether or not the Telemachus story, how that happened or whatever. 
some secular historians look at it a little bit different, but even the secular historians are interested in what they say about the end of the Gladiator Games. What secular historians say was that they just sort of fell out of this, people stopped going. If people stop going, if people stop spending their money, there's no more Gladiator Games, right? There's no more, and even secular historians say, why did people stop going? Because more and more people are becoming Christian. And they didn't want it. And they didn't want it. The whole point of this is simply to say what the government was unable to do, the kingdom of Jesus Christ did. The kingdom of Jesus Christ did. We do not need to wait for a new president. Change is always possible because God's spirit is at work. God's spirit is at work within us if we only allow him. So what do we need to do? Be open to God's spirit and take the next faithful step. It may just be a small step, but take the next faithful step. Whether it's, oh, I'm going to go to, you know, Bible study. I'm going to go to Sunday school. I'm, I'm going to just help out with that ministry or what the men or the women are doing. Or I'm going to check on my elderly neighbor. I mean, maybe a small thing. But it's the next faithful step that will begin to change the world. That's how we can change the world. Perhaps God is speaking to you about what that step may be. I do not know, but let's just take a minute to pray, to ask God's Holy Spirit to speak to us. Father God, we are so sorry that we have put so much faith in chariots and in horses and the powers of this world. When the real power has been inside of us all along. So Holy Spirit, not only speak to us, Holy Spirit empower us to help be the change that God, you so, you so much desire. Continue to lead us and guide us until Jesus returns or we are called, or we are called up to live with you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, that we know that no matter what, you have a place for us. Thank you, Father, that we are bound for the promised land and help us to let others know that they can be as well. May we use our power to show them the way, to show them the truth, and to show them the life. Amen. Amen. That um, indeed is our hymn. Um, we are bound for the promised land. Thank you.
close our service here this morning. I invite you to stand and help us sing on Jordan's stormy bank, I stand. And yes, we indeed are bound for the promised land. Hundred and stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. I am bound for the promised land, I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me <coughs> for the promised land? For all those wide extended plains shut on eternal day, there gone the sun forever reigns and scatters night away. I am bound for the promised land. I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I'm bound for the promised land. No chilling winds or poisonous breath can reach that healthful shore. Sickness and sorrow, pain and death are felt and fear no more. I am bound for the promised land. I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, and go with me I am bound for the promised land and I shall reach the happy place Father God, everything else we do is sort of wrapped up in that one thought. We are bound for the promised land. So whatever happens, good, bad, whatever, may, may we not get too high when good things happen. May, may, may we not get too low when bad things happen because the truth amongst it all is this is not our home and one day we will get to the promised land. But help us to live our lives in such a way that others can see that promised land for themselves as well. And that would all be for your great, great glory. Praise be to God and all God's children said, Amen.